Hi everyone, welcome to Tresen's martial art channel, Kung Fu Debunked, episode 6. With the size down is so efficient in combat, part 2. The reason this video took so long to make is because I'm trying to find the suitable schedule time so that I can you know, shoot the, part, the second part with my student slash friend, Eric. But unfortunately, due to his work reason, uh, you know, I waited for over two weeks, but he's just been too busy. And it looks like that he's going to be busy for the rest of the month. And obviously, I don't want to wait or drag it on any further, so I'm going to attempt to shoot this video by myself. And there are certain difficulties with it because there are, you know, places where I need somebody to stand here so I can demonstrate the moves on. Unfortunately, I won't be able to do that. So I'll just explain what I'm trying to explain and hopefully you can you know, imagine it in your head and understand what I'm trying to, to get across to you. And the reason that I decided to make a second part to that side stuff video, because initially that video wasn't intended to have two parts, it was just meant to be one video. Right? It's because for a while now I've got suggestions from viewers that my videos are too long, which um, casual viewers struggle to actually sit through the whole video. And because of that, I have been trying to make my videos a bit shorter. And in doing so, I basically had to take shortcuts in my explanation and not go thoroughly through every single possible reason before I run to a conclusion. And because of this, and there are certain people on the internet who then make counter-arguments against my content just because you know I cut corners and didn't explain everything completely, which is why this will be a more in-depth analysis on the origin and the efficiency of side stance, and hopefully I'll put those arguments to rest. But like I always say, you know, you can't argue with someone who has no reason and logic, so I'm not trying to convince those people that what they're saying is wrong, but for the rest of you who don't have a prejudice or a biased stance, you know, hopefully this video would make more sense to you in the end. So to start off the video, uh, let's first qualify what exactly is a side stance, okay? because there seems to be some confusion to what actually constitutes of a side stance. For example, if someone commented that you know, a horse stance is a side stance. Well, the problem here is, what well, a side stance is a type of horse stance, a horse stance is not always a side stance. Okay? So a horse stance typically is a stance where the width of your stance, your feet, varies, but overall it's a stance where your legs are apart, your body is in the center of your two legs, it's not linked to one side or the other, and you bend your leg and keep your body up straight. So this is basically a horse stance. You can think of this as riding a horse. Okay? Um, it's essentially how you ride a horse, Without a horse, that is a horse down, and that's precisely where you got the name horse down from in the Chinese language, is to imitate riding a horse. Initially, this stance was actually used by people who are meant to be cavalry riders, but they don't have access to the horse the whole time, or the beginners who need to learn to use weaponry on a horseback, but you don't just get on a horse with a weapon, you first need to get familiarized with the movement of the weapon, right? which is why in the Chinese culture or custom, people will start off on a horse dance and then they'll for example, hold a spear here and then they'll practice the spear motion while imitating that they're riding on a horse and after a while then they get onto the horseback and then actually try it out for real. And there's two good things for this. First of all, when you're unfamiliar with the weapon movement, you know, Maybe this isn't completely true, but at least to my ancestors, the Chinese people, they believe that you know you take baby steps, you first practice without horse, and then you go onto a horse. And secondly, doing horse dance trains your leg muscles, which you do need to control your horse with, so you're not actually wasting your time either. You are still gaining training that you need to be a good rider. So this is the origin of horse dance, but eventually, uh, you know martial arts that doesn't use horse anymore on, on foot, they will also start to use horse down as a basic training. But obviously, you don't want to fight somebody in this stance because your whole body exposed, which is why eventually the horse stance was used as a sideways horse stance so that you minimize the surface of attack your opponent has on you 
And like I said in my previous video, this actually first daughter was infantry soldier with weapon, whether it is spear, right? Not not horse spear, where you sit on a horse and hold the spear here, or what or you can call it a lance on the on the horseback. But an infantry spear where you wanna stand like this and hold the weapon. So for example, if I were a, a rider with a lance, I would basically practice this by holding a horse down here and I'll hold the spear here. Obviously the lance will be a lot longer than my spear. But the idea is this, and then I'll basically hold the stance and I'll, I'll practice certain motions that you know is required. Obviously I don't know what they are because I don't do horse launching, but I have seen footage of um of, of system that survived to, to this day where they practice spear on the horse stance and they hold the spear close to their body rather than extending their arms like infantry, right? So this is what horse originally was for, but obviously as I explained in my previous video, uh, infantry troops also adopt the horse stance but on the sideways stance so that you minimize the attack surface of your body and then you hold the spear this way. And of course, like I said in, in the previous video as well, later on when you have sword and broad sword and short weapon, they also adopted a side stance where they have the main weapon hand over here to protect the body and for maximum reach. So, so some of the arguments saying that Chinese hand-to-hand -hand martial art did not come from military training or weapon, and that is pretty much incorrect. As far as the information that we have discovered to this day suggests, you know, the, the current Chinese traditional martial art, right, mostly originally in the, in the Qing Dynasty, some in the late Ming Dynasty, and the most clear manuscript or record that we have is from General Qi Ji Guang, right, late Ming Dynasty general. He's a military manual, Qi Xiao Xin Shu, you know, they have a chapter, Quan Jing Jie Yao. And in it, it described all the hand-to-hand -hand civilian martial art found at the time, and it also included his own summary of hand-to-hand uh, -hand training that he taught his troops, which is called the Qi Ji Guang City Tu Posture. In that manual, he clearly stated that hand-to-hand -hand training or fist or striking art, you know, striking style, Quan Fa, has no big use on the battlefield. However, it is useful to train troops for basic numberness, strength, stamina, etc. It is useful for basic training, which is why he adopted it and trained his troops with it. And this is pretty much the origin of the idea that one had to train hand to hand before learning weaponry, which is pretty much the norm in any traditional Chinese martial arts system. If you go to any Chinese martial arts system and you ask them, can I just, I have no background in martial arts, I do not train weapons, they'll tell you no, you can't. You have to learn the basic training, the hand-to-hand -hand form, empty hand form, and then learn weaponry. So this has been the mentality of every single Chinese traditional martial arts system to this day. However, this is actually not required if you look at, for example, in Japan. Samurai do not need to learn hand-to-hand -hand combat before they learn how to use a katana. And, you know, in Europe, Knight don't have to learn hand-to-hand -hand combat before they learn how to swing a long sword, claymore, or whatever weapon of their choice. So we can see that globally, right, we can see that hand training, first training is not required to be a master of weaponry. And the reason Chinese martial art believes that way is most likely due to the fact that Qi Ji Guang wrote it in his book that you know, his soldier trained hand-to-hand -hand before they trained weaponry. So what this shows us is that his book and his city to posture has a very deep influence on all the Chinese martial arts that came after his period. And obviously him being a military general, training troops for the military, which is spear or broadsword at that time, as the main weaponry, you know, besides archery and firearm, you know, the, the main cold weapon is spear and broadsword. So for him, being a general that wants his troops to be efficient in those weapons, he obviously going to modify his first form to match the, character the characteristic of those weaponry, which is why he heavily adopted the side stance. Because that can translate easily into weaponry combat for military purpose. And this is why all the martial style that was influenced by his manuscript all kind of also adopted the side stance. The history and the connection from the late Ming to the current Chinese martial art is pretty clear. And I don't even see why there is even a, a room for argument here. 
Now, let's just qualify what exactly is a size dance. A size dance is basically when you have a horse dance, and if you draw a line from your rear foot heel to your opponent, right? If you draw a straight line from your rear foot to your opponent, your front foot is on the exact same line. That's basically a side stomp. So what this means is, if your two foot feet are not on the same line, in other words, if I'm standing like this, then that's not, strictly speaking, a side stomp. Or if I'm standing like this, it's not exactly a side stomp. If I point this directly in front of my camera, then these two legs have to be on the same line towards my opponent. So that is what a side stomp entails. Which is why, in modern combat sports, even though the stance looks almost like a side stance, it is clearly not because that line, the, the two legs, the two feet are not on the exact same line. They're actually a bit spaced across for better balancing and maneuverability and agility, side stepping, etc. Whereas this stance is very hard to do any motion other than forward and backwards, which is all the military ever needed. If you think about it, you, you advance and then you retreat. There's very little room, especially in the formation, to go sideways and to rotate, etc. Which is why a side stance works perfectly in a military setting. And when later on, anti hand combat system in China adopted the side stance, they basically are also somewhat limited to the maneuverability that came with the military training, which is forward and back. Which brings us to the next question that one of my more active viewers uh, asked me about, which I think is a totally good and valid question is that you know he observed some of the UFC fighters such as Wonderboy who has a background in karate and he would sometimes use side stunts in the UFC fight. So does that mean you know side stunts is actually efficient in combat? Well here's the thing right side stunts has its place and if you observe you know these uh, UFC fighters tournaments uh, you can see that they only use side stunts in very selective scenarios. For example with Wonderboy when he, his opponent is away from him, then he goes into a side stance and trying to get off a side kick. And he'll try to control the with the punch. But then the, the whole the main goal here is to actually get through a hard side kick. But the moment the opponent comes close enough in punching range, he would also then transfer back to a more modern combat stance where both hands have equal access and able to do first combination, right? He doesn't stay in the side stance forever. So they are no absolutes in this world, or almost no absolutes. So when I say a side stance isn't efficient, what I meant is that a side stance, a predominant stance that you fight from, is inefficient, okay? But obviously once in a while, when the situation calls for it, of course you can use a side stance. There's no rules against not able to use side stance. But if your entire fighting game evolves around using a side stance as your main stance where you launch your attacks, so in this today's world, you are at a severe disadvantage versus other more evolved combat systems. And this brings us to the next topic, which someone made this uh, argument that, you know, even in traditional Chinese martial art, people don't fight from a side stance. You know, he's saying that whoever is fighting from a side stance, they don't know what the hell they are, they are doing. But in my system, we don't fight from a side stance. Well, here's the thing, okay? If 90% of the people in Chinese martial arts from these long first variant styles fighting from a side stance and you are the only ones that don't fight from a side stance then chances are your lineage is the one that evolved rather than the norm and everyone else is don't know what they are doing okay? um, If everyone is doing something different to each other then you can say maybe nobody knows what the hell is going on but when everyone else agrees on the same mode of combat, on the use of side stance, and you come and you say no, but they're all wrong, I'm right, then, you know, it is not actually very believable or credible unless you can provide solid evidence that you, know, you have been using other stances ever since the founding era of your form, of your style, which I believe is impossible to provide, and in that case, the logic dictates that it's more possible that everyone else will agree on the same thing is how it always has been in, in the historical period, and whatever you experience, either you changed it or your master changed it or his master changed it somewhere along the line, changed it and, uh, and adapted. Which is not a bad thing, okay? I'm not against evolving and changing and being better, okay? That is what everything in, in this world is supposed to be. You're supposed to get better each generation, not, you know, staying the same or get worse. However, it's just like I'm driving a car today, but I can't say my great-grandfather had been driving cars since his era. Well, that's not possible, right? You have to accept 
you have to accept the fact that back in the days they weren't as evolved or advanced as we are today. So just because you're no longer using a size that as you meant a uh, stance for fighting, it doesn't mean that your style never has been, okay? So that is not a very fair argument. So the point is, it's good to evolve, but you have to also accept what history for what it is. And if we observe the majority of people who does Northern Long First variant styles, you can clearly see that they have very heavy emphasis on size stance. And I believe I've shown enough videos of various forms and styles in my, in my part one video to get my point across. And if you just go on the internet and you search for these styles, like Hua Quan, Hong Quan, as in red first, right? Not the Cantonese Hong Ga, but a, a northern, a northwestern style in China called red first, Hong Quan. And if you look at uh, Cha Quan, if you look at Yan Qing Quan, you look at Pi Gua Quan, you look at Ba Ji Quan. Look at all these stunts, a lot more that I, I don't have time to mention all of them. You can clearly see that they have a very heavy emphasis on side stunts. And you can't simply deny that. Another argument that people like to make is that, you know, maybe what you do in the form is different to how they fight. Now, this is a very common thing people like to say because I do admit that Chinese martial arts are quite secretive, right? There's a lot of secrets that you don't want to tell people, tell outsiders, or even tell. Your, your general students, you want to keep it for your selected few favorites, disciples, etc. However, those are interpretations and knowledge. There's no actual form, right? It doesn't make sense if you fight one way, but you do your form in a completely different way. That's just stupid because the whole point of training is to train a certain habit of your body, a certain habit of motion. So if every day in your form, you're doing size down punch, ball punch, size down punch, but you telling me when you fight, you don't even use this at, at all, that makes no sense. That just means all the time you put in the training the form, it, it's wasted. In fact, it's not just wasted, it's going against what you want to do when you're in a fight. It's counterproductive. And that is not how any legit Chinese martial arts style should function, right? So what, what this basically means is that if a style, in, the, in its form, you see a lot of side stones, bow stones, and back to side stones, and come this way, then chances are that's exactly how they intend to fight with in a size stance, okay? Then some people might think, okay, but if I look at any of these styles form, right, they don't only have size stance. For example, right, the form does not look like this. And then step punch, step back, punch, step back, do something. It doesn't look like they actually have other stuff as well. Like, you know, sometimes they will punch, punch, and they will jump and punch this way, and then they will jump and punch this way. And once in a while, you know, they will like do a turn around move, and then punch again, etc. So there are other variations. It's not the whole form, it's just repeating size down forward and back. Now there are two main reasons for this, right? First of all, a form that only have size down, it looks stupid and boring. And you know, and people don't like that. And just before someone you know come and say that, you know, looking good aesthetically is only a modern contemporary wushu interpretation of Chinese martial arts, that's actually not true. What well, is true that modern contemporary wushu turned martial art into gymnastic-like sport. However, even back in the days, Chinese martial community, the traditional Chinese martial community, still valued aesthetic value, right? You can go back to the Republic era or even the late Qing dynasty and you will see people describing certain form and style with artistic expression. Like they will say the style flows like river or you know, flows like cloud or moves like a dragon. So this doesn't mean that they want the movement to be flowery and dance-like, but what this does mean is that they also, beside utilitarian purposes, you know, how useful or practical a style is, they also care about how it looks. So what that means is obviously when they're designing a form, they're going to try to make more variation so the form looks more pleasing than just simply back and forth, side stance all, all the way, right? Because a form like that, you know, it's just not nice enough for people to practice. That's the first reason. And the second reason is that there are these complicated stuff like you know rotating and doing other moves. They do want to apply these in combat as well. Okay. However, not everything in every style is completely practical. It, it, it will depend on what kind of people you are fighting. So, for example, if you're fighting a little kid, you can make anything you know practical. You can, you can do a double somersault spin kick and still be okay with it. But the moment you're fighting someone who is 
well versed in combat as well that a lot of the more risky moves you don't want to use them anymore because there's a higher risk of you getting hit or lose a fight instead which is why for example if you look at a Wing Chun right when they're doing their practice there are a lot of flowery hands that they, they can use but when actually two unrelated Wing Chun people fight each other most of the time they're just doing Chen Punch maybe they have a little bit of variation but in most likely it's just Chen Punch now I'm not saying that's how, in Chun, the how Wing Chun should be but what it shows us is that when you're under pressure you tend to revert back to the most simplistic mode of combat right what that means is so why in some of these forms they have some you know cool turns and stuff that you know it's it's not just the boring side stance but when you actually are fighting against someone when the pressure is on then you feel a huge risk in doing these, these turning moves or like you know doing turn around and doing a punch this way and when the guy is constantly trying to pressure you then you also then are forced to just have the most simplistic side stance and try to defend yourself with this hand and then try to attack, maybe attack with the hand a bit and then come back that could also be why that even though in the form there are other variations to the step works to kicks and stuff but when actually you are in a fighting scenario with this real pressure they revert back to predominantly using a side stance I mean, that's the most practical thing to do when you are under pressure and the same can be applied to any of these traditional two-man sets that you've seen, right? Which is also, you know, if you look at any of these styles two-man sets These soldiers have received the Lord of the Lord's Lord and have given the Lord of the Lord's Lord. Also, don't just have two guys standing in side stance and doing block punch, step back, block punch, step back. They also sometimes have other variations, like like they'll step here, step here, do some punch, step here, and then they'll back to. But you can see that they always come back to this side stance and the bow stance, right? Majority of the attack are still going to be launched either in the side core stance or in the bow stance. This is the bread and butter of these two men set. And again, if they put under pressure then these are the two stances that they will most likely re revert to, right? These complicated side steppings and other things. You must never see them uh, in a fight, at least not among Chinese martial art practitioners who, does, who doesn't you know, infuse uh, you know, modern combat sport. When you see them fight, they will, use like, they will most likely be in a side stance all the time and being pressured too much to do any other funny steps that deviate from the main side stance and both stance variation. And then if someone insists that they don't use side stance in their traditional Chinese martial arts system, which is happened to be a long fist variant, right? You have to stress that because there are styles in China that move away from side stance or evolve away from side stance. And those are not the styles that I'm talking about in my video. I'm targeting specifically those styles that are still using side stance as the main stance of fighting. So if your style is part of one of those variants, but you insist that you don't use a side stance, then the big question is, what combat stance do you use, right? If you are fighting in the modern stance, right, any variation of, of boxing, Muay Thai, MMA, whatever, then clearly that stance was influenced by modern combat sport. You know, you're not gonna be able to convince anyone 
that you that your lineage has been fighting like this ever since the Qing Dynasty. That is simply not possible. Okay. And next, then we can ask them what exactly is the traditional stance that you can fight from. Out of these loafers variants of Chinese martial arts, there are basically four fundamental stances, right? I mean, there are variations of maybe five, uh, give or take, you know, each style is slightly different, but there are some that are shared among all these styles. First of all, it's a horse stance. Obviously, you're not gonna fight somebody a horse stance facing forward because your whole body is exposed. So if you're gonna ever use a horse stance in a fight, it will have to be a side stance. Second is a bow stance, which is basically just a variation of the horse stance, side stance, right? This is when you're using this side of your punch, you want to punch with the other hand. It's quite difficult like this, so you basically rotate and then you can reach someone. So this is the bow stance. Now, could it be that you know, so these styles predominantly fight from a bow stance? And the uh, answer is most likely not, because the bow stance is even more immobile than the side horse stance. Okay? If you're standing like this, it's much harder to move forward and to move back, because your legs are kind of stretched out. Whereas if you're standing like this, it's easier to shift due to the, you know, the motion of your hip. Whereas like this, because your back leg is really straight, it can't actually push you forward. And also when you're trying to retreat, it's also hard to retreat back. Which is why I don't think you know, any style predominantly fight from a bow stance. Now if you see you know, a style or two men set doing a lot of motion in the bow stance, that is fine, that's not contradicting to what I'm saying. right? That just means it's the person standing here and they're trading blows, they're not actually moving. In this case, this is fine. But obviously, before you actually engage someone with trading blows, you just stop the fight in a bow stance, then the other person can easily outmaneuver you with agility because you just can't keep up with any mo mobile opponent. And obviously, just in case I might be confused this with, say, the, you know, Western fencing, right? In fencing, they have those stance, but they actually kind of light on their toes so that they, they can move forward and move back. But tiptoeing is a big no-no in traditional martial arts. They want your foot to have root on the ground. The moment you have your whole flat feet on the ground, then the bow stance becomes much harder to move forward and back. The third stance that is very common in all these martial art variants is the shui bu, or what we call the empty step, right? which is like this. you put your weight in the back and you have this leg in the front, tiptoeing, and you have your hand here. Now this is actually a stance that is very likely to be a stance you want to fight from. However, if you're talking about any of these long first variants, you've got to ask yourself, okay, but then what attack can I launch from this? I mean, you're going to do punches like this, or you're going to step in and do a punch like that. And if you look at any, the way that any of these forms are designed, you can see that often they will start off the form, for example, in the empty step, but the moment they start launching a punch, they will be in the bow stance and in the side horse stance. Very often do you see them launching punches in the stance. And if they do, it's not a continuous punch, it's just like once, and then they will move forward and into a, a bow stance or a horse stance. So what this tells us that while it is possible that you know, these stars can start off a fight in the stance, but this can't be the stance they fight from because it doesn't give them access to majority of their punches. Right? Unless what you are doing is you're standing like this, you do a, a bow stance, you do a punch, and you come back here, you do a side stance, do a punch, a punch, and you come back here. You know, then it can work, but obviously uh, that's very tiring and it's very slow, you can't just, you can't move from those stances back, back into those stance and then back to those stance as efficient as if I'm just staying in the side stance, I'm just doing punches like this, I move back, block, come forward and I punch. This is a much more functioning method to fight from than being like this, unless your style actually launch attack from this stance without going into a side stance or a bow stance. Now there are stances like that out there, for example, um, Tongbei, right, Tongbei is a Northern style that doesn't have, almost doesn't have side stance and they doesn't, almost doesn't use bow stance. Instead, most of his moves are launched from the stance. And you can see that from the basic training. For example, Wu Xing Tong Bei, the one that I currently practice. There are five basic handwork and all of them are practiced while in the stance. So if I'm going to do Shui Zhang, the first one, I stand in the stance and I do this. 
Okay. Uh, pi jump. I do this. And uh, try. P. And Zuan is the only one that stays forward, but still, it's not a, a size down, right? You see? So, a style like this, if you look at the basic training, you can clearly see that this style, Tongbei, Wuxing Tongbei, does not fire from the side stance or bow stance. And it's intended to fire from this stance. I can spark in this stance and very comfortably launch all the, all the attacks I want to launch. But if this whole style, trendy punches, like this and like that, then you know you can't tell me that they actually fight from, from this stance because you know the actual blueprint of the style, the form and the technique is says otherwise. So this rules out this stance being the predominant stance to fight from. And what's next? Next is basically a uh, I don't know what it's called in English. Basically a step like this. So what this is is basically a, a natural evolution. From if I stand on this one and I do a side stance, and I want to punch with the other hand, I can either do a bow stance and punch, or I can bring this leg in and punch like this, and then step and do a, and basically turn myself to the other side and still keeping the side stance bow stance combination. So it's almost like a link between a side stance this way and a side stance this way. You can also often see this with kicks. So I'll punch here, and I'll come here, and I'll launch a kick. And then block, punch, punch, etc. So could it be possible that someone fight from this as a main stance? Obviously not, because uh, not only is this, is this stance not mobile, it also puts you in a pretty awkward position, right? You only want to get in here for a split second and then get get out of it. You don't want to, you know, stop. You don't want to start your fight like this. The next one is called a pool which looks something like this. Uh, can you fight from this? Uh, most likely not, because you're even more immobile than the bow stance. If you want to fight something like this, uh, you're sitting down to, to get kicked on this leg, or, or to get, you know, you're basically sitting down for everything. So all these five main stances, whole stance is the one that makes the most sense that someone will fight from. And that also agree with observation, that data. If you look at majority of these people, when they do fight, they're using a side stance, right? I'm talking about the ones who are not influenced by modern combat sport, who will fight like, like the modern way. But the old school people, right, they will fight like this. And it makes sense because that is one of the only stunts out of the five main stances that they can have easy access to most of the attacks, easy transition to a bow stance, easy transition to this stance should you need it, and easy, easy transition into this stance if you need it. The other stances are not as convenient as the horse side stance, which is why if you look at all this evidence, you can also see that you know, the side stance had to be the main stance that people used to fight from back in the days before modern influence from combat sports. Now another way that we can look at this is by looking at that particular move that I mentioned in a previous video, right? Where someone standing in the side stance, you engage by rotating your own stance and then you try to trap his leg in order to throw him over, right? That kind of leg trapping technique. Now this is almost like if we look at a prehistorical environment, a scientist can more or less figure out what kind of animal you know lives in that environment, or should I say the animal that does did, did live in the prehistorical environment, what kind of traits they will have, right? Because whatever the animal are, it's gonna be a reflection of the environment they live in. So in the same sense, in the Chinese martial art world back in the days, we can also derive to the same type of logic and conclusion. The fact that so many different styles have this kind of technique, and by this kind of technique, I mean where you, where you basically try to rotate yourself and then trap somebody's side stance, whether it is the front leg or the back leg, right? Imagine somebody standing here, I want to do something and then step around him, behind him, and then try to throw him off balance. This kind of Technique. You can see it in a lot of different styles. And the fact that um, everyone has this kind of technique and favorite kind of technique, 
which suggests that size dance might be quite common among the martial artists during that time. As you know, if size dance is not the predominant style that people fight from, then not then these styles shouldn't all have this kind of trapping technique. Right? Just to give you an example, for example, in Pi Gua, it looks something like this. So it's here, here, and then there. And this move you meant to throw the guy out. And for example, in Baji, you can see it in this move, right? Where they step across, and then that motion, you know, the guy standing here, and he's supposed to go through and then throw him off balance. And of course, you know, in some people's interpretation of, of Tai Chi, whether it's single verb or whether it is um Lan Jai is there to throw somebody off balance. So you kind of see this thing in a lot of different styles. And but the thing is, right, like I said, if people don't actually fight in the stones, or you know, only once in a blue moon someone comes up in the stones, then there shouldn't be a reason why all these styles have have particular techniques used against it. Therefore, because of the fact that all these styles have these kind of trapping techniques that would then tell us that back in the days it is quite common to catch an opponent in a side stance. Another argument made against my video is that you know side stance is only used in the moment of an offensive attack. But again, you know, my previous topic I already talked about then what stance do you fight in? If you don't fight in side stance, do you fight in the empty step, do you fight in a bow stance? You know, and through the analysis that we've done already, size down is the most logical one to find from. You have the most access to all your tools and attack and strikes and side and stun switching. Right, size stones can easily switch into other stances, whereas these other stones have the limitations and also mobility. And another thing that I mentioned in my previous video is that in a modern context, somebody does a size down to try to come around and track my leg. All I need to do is to turn the angle of this of my rear leg. And I'll be able to switch to a different angle and punch him in the face, punch him in the ribs or whatever, right? Which is why this, this kind of trapping technique, you don't see it in modern day anymore. At least not, not when you are, you know, fighting against people who don't use side stunts anymore, such as modern combat sport. I mean, in the UFC, you will still use this kind of leg trap, but it's usually, you know, I don't have a partner, unfortunately, you, you clench the guy and you trap his leg like this and you lean on him, for example, to trip him over. The fact that nobody fighting a side stance all the time pretty much eliminated this kind of technical approach where you want to go around a guy's leg and then throw them off balance. So pretty much by examining what kind of technique is predominant for that period, you can pretty much also then know what kind of stances they are fighting from. And of course, you know, if once in a while somebody did a technique that looks similar to this kind of horse stance trapping technique, or you know, once in a while somebody used a side stance in the UFC, for example, it doesn't really prove the norm. It is an exception. Okay, it's just like you know, a lot of dogs that I've seen, you know, from my friend's house, etc. They sometimes eat grass. But can you then say that you know dogs are herbivores? No, you can't because the predominant diet is still meat or dog pellets, you know, in human society. But the point is, this is just because they occasionally eat grass doesn't make them a herbivore. So, if once in a while someone uses a size down or uses a technique that kind of looks like a size down trapping, it doesn't mean that it doesn't prove that this is still a very valid thing, right? I mean, there's always a chance for something to work. But when anyone is prepared for a fight or just training, you want to put your time and effort on the things that are most likely going to come up rather than you know, the once in a blue moon chance for something to actually be able to be used efficiently. Which is why you know, if any of you want to link me videos of people using side stunts or you know, side stunts trapping technique, then you, know, you have to prove that it is a norm. You can just show me one example and say, yeah, there you go, you know, this is totally e efficient. But if you look through 100, 200 different UFC fights, you realize that majority of them don't have it, you know, which means that not using it is a norm, using it is an exception. You can't use the ex exception to prove the norm. And regarding the counter to a side stance trapping leg where you step this way and punch, right, uh, people who, who say that this kind of roll and cutting angle against you know, the side stance trapping leg is nothing new. Traditional, traditional Chinese martial arts have it already. 
And I will show this example of the eagle claw system where when you're standing in a size down, somebody traps the leg, then basically what the person does is he turns around and then faces the guy, the guy's here and, and he is here, and then they, they do something with their hands. Now while this is sort of like what I mentioned in the previous video about cutting angle, it is not quite the same thing. Okay, because if somebody trying to trap your leg and in response you step this way and effectively ro you rotate yourself, yeah, that is fine, but you're literally exposing your whole body to your opponent right here. And that, I would say, makes it quite an inefficient way to counter this kind of trapping leg stance kind of technique. Because by getting out of this trap, you are, you are giving a free ticket to your entire body and all the weakness. The difference is, in the previous video, my explanation to countering this one, you basically just cut a smooth turn, so that he's come trapping here, you take this, and you'll be able to punch back, and you are still in the ideal fighting position. You're not overexposing yourself. I can still cover up all my weaknesses, right? So if you look from here, if I'm standing here, this guy come and trap me, I take a small angle away from his trap, and I can still punch him and cover myself and protect. But if I'm standing here, he comes with the trap down, I step this way, then my whole body is under his attack. And so I would say this is actually not the same solution, and this one is a pretty bad one. And furthermore, this is not a standard solution, right? The person who made a comment on this suggests that you know, this is nothing new, everyone knows about cutting angle back days already. And I would say that is rubbish. If everybody were able to cut angle, and I mean by cutting angle, I mean to cut the way I do, then no one would be using this trapping technique anymore. People wouldn't be favoring these techniques if the success rate of such a technique is very, very low. And if everyone knows how to just turn a core, turn an angle and hit back, then the success rate of such approach will be so low that people would already drop it out of the system. And the evidence that we can see today suggests otherwise. And furthermore, if you look at other styles two men set, right? The, I don't mean ego cruel, but like other styles, you can clearly see that everyone have different understanding on how to get out, out of this kind of trap. Or a very common one, for example, when somebody comes around and try to trap my leg, they basically step this way and then steps out. And obviously they'll do it faster, so it'll be here, and they'll jump out of, of the trap. Another one that lost our favors is that when someone comes and trap a leg, you basically turn, you pick up this leg, and you come this way. Pick up the leg, and you come that way. That's another way to get out of it. So there are different ways that people use to get out of this. Even one where when you come and trap, you turn around and then do it this side. And you can see that there are no universal common approach on countering this trapping step. And definitely there's not one that is to cut a minor angle and you need to be able to put the pressure back onto the other person. And this brings to another characteristic of this long first variant of Chinese martial art, is that they mostly go linear. Now, I say mostly because there are times where they are both skewed, they go in core angles, etc. But majority of the time, if you observe their form, they are going linear. Their punches are going on the same line as their stones, and they will kick, punch, and they will be going forward, and they will be coming back. When they rotate, they will still be on the same line. The whole form will be drawn on that singular line. And this also that this suggests that the combat approach is quite linear, it's going forward and back. It is not like in modern day where you suddenly go just straight forward and back. What you do, you, you know, when somebody comes and attack you, you try to, somebody is attacking you here, you try to cut the angle here, and when you turn it around, you want to, you know, you're constantly trying to change your angle rather than only going forward and back. There's another first evidence to show why people back in the days were using side stone, because it's the most ideal for going forward and back linear, but it's not ideal for trying to cut corners or try to cut angles because in this kind of stance it's very it's more difficult to move like this therefore but it's, it's easier to move this way and that way and when there are styles in China that do have these angle cutting techniques which came much later on it's not from the late Ming to early Qing dynasty and when those styles 
Let's have this technique you can clearly see in the form. I'll give you an example. So for example, in Mantle, there's a technique that looks like this, right? So you will do a punch here, and then they will step here, and then punch there. Right, then do that again, so you punch, 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 step, punch there, step, and punch there, for example. And this is clearly an angle cutting technique, because you want to do this to someone, and the moment he blocks the punch, you, then you step this way, you grab, and you're cutting an angle into him, and avoiding his strikes, or it goes the other way. So when you see technique like this in the form, do you know that this particular style does, it does employ the concept of cutting angles. But if you look at the long first variant, right, majority of them do not have this kind of technique. They approach to the form and the a technique are pretty linear. And from that you can know that they are not trend or taught to cut angles against someone. They are basically taught to go forward and back. And lastly, let's look at some of the later born styles right, that are not directly born in the late Ming to early Qing dynasty, styles that derive at the later onset, like mid Qing dynasty to near Republic era, and see how these styles tend to start to move away from predominantly fighting from a side stance. Now, of course, in today's world, we don't have real video evidence of how people fight back in the days. That's unfortunately impossible to, to get. So the only thing we can do is to look at the form, look at how people train, look at the treatment set, and then get a very good idea of most likely how they approach combat back in the days. And obviously if you're just looking at the long first variant, you know, it might not be very apparent that they use a lot of side downs. But the moment you compare them to other styles that don't use a lot of side downs, then you can start to see the difference that oh, you know, even though a long first variant style isn't 100% on side downs, but, the, but you see side downs and bow downs and these punches are far more in these styles than in the later developed styles that don't want to fight in side downs and favors both hands having equal reach and equal opportunity to attack. So firstly, I'm going to show you a short clip of a rendition of the general Qi Ji Guang's 32 posture, right, coming from his first classic. Now, I don't know if this is exactly how general Qi Ji Guang taught his truth back in the Ming Dynasty, because unfortunately, all he left us is a manuscript with pictures and descriptions, but there was no video back then. So it's not really possible to tell whether these people are basically doing exactly what Qi Guang was doing. However, the, the pose, the postures, and the movement does fit the manuscript. But exactly how the movement flows through them, uh, we can only get, right? There's no precise evidence to compare them to. But it will give you a rough idea of how empty hand martial art looked like in the late Ming Dynasty, more or less. Not accurate, but it's probably the best example we can have. And as you can see, right, in this entire form, which isn't very long, majority of the time, they are fighting from a side stance. And furthermore, there's a lot of moves where they're shuffling, they're doing techniques this way and doing techniques back, so they're shuffling in a, in a linear kind of side stance motion, just like I was mentioning how Chinese martial arts used to fight back in the days to move sideways like a trap, right, going forward and going back. And furthermore, when you see them doing other things, like for example, when they move back, they were using this step, and then they were like, you know, swing the arms, and then do something here, swing the arms back, do something there, and occasionally they have a turn, where they go like this, but, you know, if you pay attention, everything works on that same axis, there's no angle cutting, there's no rotating this way, or rotating that way, it's all in one axis, right, forward and back, everything is very linear, and this is a, it's a great evidence to show that this training were intended to prepare troops for weaponry in a formation where all you can go is forward and back. You can't go sideways. There's no point in designing 
corner cutting, angle cutting techniques, everything needs to go forward and back. And that form shows us very apparently. Next, I'm going to show you a short portion of a clip from Eagle Claw Fan First style. Right? In Chinese, we call it Ying Zhao Fan Zi Quan. In English, it's commonly known as Eagle Claw because I think people don't know what Fan Zi is, so they kind of just, you know, abbreviated out of the, the naming. This is called Eagle Claw. But whenever anyone talks about Eagle Claw, they're actually referring to a hybrid style where Eagle Claw merged with another northern long first variant style called Fan Zi Quan. So the its full name in Chinese is called Indra Fan Zi Quan. And this style originated in a small town outside Beijing called Xiongxian. I have a friend there that practices this style. And one of the person who commented on my previous video claimed to practice Eagle Claw and he claimed that side style is not used for striking but used for grappling. The strange thing is, even though he practiced Eagle Claw, he seemed to not know that the style is actually a fusion between a grappling of Eagle Claw plus Fan Zi Quan, which is a northern striking art that doesn't have any grapple. Another irony here is that because he insists that Chinese martial arts is more about grappling and not about striking, which is completely wrong. I'm going to have a separate video just dealing with the history and the naming of Chinese martial art to examine whether it is more grappling or more striking. Of course, Chinese martial arts have grappling, has drain locking, has striking, but it's certainly incorrect to say that it is more about grappling and less about striking, that is completely wrong. Because Eagle Claw in today's world no longer exists independently. The only Eagle Claw that, as far as I know, that it has a legit lineage is Indra Fan Zi Quan. It's a hybrid between Eagle Claw and Fan Zi Quan. However, Fan Zi Quan, on the other hand, is still an independent style, right? Some people merge the two and become Indra Fan Zi Quan, but there are others who are still independent Fan Zi Quan. There are a lot of Fan Zi Quan practitioners in China, whether it's in, in Xi'an, or the, the, the northwestern province, whether it's in Beijing, Hebei, there's a lot of different branches of Fan Zi Quan. And what this shows you is that uh, a style that purely focuses on striking tends to survive through history, whereas a style that only has joint lockings and grabbing, you know, needed to fuse with another striking art to actually survive through history. So what is more important is obviously clear. And I'm not saying that you know drone locking is completely useless, but you know from the historical evidence of how these styles evolve, we can see that striking is the only kind of style that tend to be able to stay on its own. Whereas you know ego claw need to merge with a striking style to actually survive through history, survival of the fittest, right? Natural selection. And another thing, right? In today's world, we're talking about grappling. It's usually things like jujitsu. Um, Greco wrestling, modern wrestling, or Chinese wrestling. So, in those styles, they definitely don't fight off a, a side stance. So, it's very confusing for that person to say, you know, side stance is the most important stance in grappling because, uh, you know, it is not. Right? You, I mean, I don't know about Greco wrestling, uh, but, you know, in Chinese wrestling, people fight in a more left and right stance. Nobody fight in this stance because it hinders your maneuverability. There are times where if I grab somebody and I'm going in for a throw, you know, for a moment it will look like a side stance, but actually, you know, I'm doing something in a fluid motion. I don't want to fight in a side stance because in doing so, this arm has more reach than this, right? And in, and in wrestling, Chinese wrestling, you want to, you want to both hands to be able to grab someone. Obviously, I can't really show any Chinese wrestling stuff here because I'm, I'm, I'm alone, but I just want to quickly address that point. So it's incorrect to say that side stance is most important in grappling, but it's not. Right? The majority of the grappling, which is Chinese wrestling in general, they don't want to use a side stance. The occasion time where, you know, if I'm already holding the guy and I'm trying to do a technique, maybe I want to step through him, almost like a side stance, and then from there maybe grab his leg here and then throw him over or whatever. But, you know, if you see two rest, Chinese wrestlers engaged, they will not engage in, in a side stance. It will be something more like this. And then they will grab each other and then see how to get hold of them and then go with the throwing. Alright, so let's watch a clip of Ying Zhao Fan Zi Quan demonstrating its striking motion. Alright, and you can see, it's a very short clip, but the person is basically standing in a classic side stance and he's doing this. And then he switched to this side and doing that. 
So what they say is that they clearly are using size dance for striking and not for purely joint locking like this eagle claw practitioner are saying. I'm not saying that they don't use eagle claw with a size dance, but what I'm saying is that they are using size dance for striking as well. And you can clearly see that when he wants to switch to the other side, he doesn't just use a bow stance to punch the other arm, he literally has to shift his stance over to an opposite side side stance to repeat that technique. And that is how prevalent the side stance is in this particular style. But somehow, one of his practitioners, probably from overseas, not from the Chinese branch, are trying to say that side stance is only used for grappling but not for striking, which as you can see from here, is completely incorrect. Next, I'm going to show you some other short examples of other Chinese styles that are prevalent in using side stance. So, you, know, you can probably just do Google search or YouTube search and find these yourself, but you know, here's a few just to add on to my original point. about Baji, right? Baji is another style that is very prevalent in using side stance. And you can see it very clearly from its form. For example, in a small Baji form, I mean, yes, you start off in, a, in this stance, but the moment you make an a strike, it's a side stance. And after the when you follow up a strike, it's another side, it's the exact same side stance. Right, so they basically are continuing they strike continuously from a side stance. And when we want to strike with the other hand, well, you know, in the form from here, then it comes back, and it's like an like elbow to take technique, and there. And then this, although it's not a side stance, but you can see it's still a sideways stance. And then from here, you see, it comes back to a side stance. Then here, and then from here, another side stance. And when you want to strike with the other hand, I mean, there are times where you will do a, a punch like this, but one of the more better known you know, switching side attack is like this. So again, you see, that's how they switch to another side side stance, right? In fact, one of the basic training is to go around like that. Now, why would you want to keep pressing this if side stance isn't your main mode of attack? So it's kind of obvious that these styles are using side stance 
most of the time. And these other stances are more like the icing on the cake and you know the exception. But the norm is clearly side stance. And if you know convergence, you can also look at the large baji, right? The large frame baji. Where again, they'll start off like this. Side stance, there's like one back, side stance, both stance, side stance, both stance, side stance, both stance, and they'll end up the side stance. The trapping mode motion, the trapping technique. So you can see that every almost every every main attack is deployed through side stunts. Next, you're gonna watch a video of Pigua. Now the interesting thing about Pigua is that they don't actually have a clear cut side stance, meaning that they're not always in this stance. However, they are still using the same idea in their fighting, meaning that they either fight this way or they will turn around and fight this way. So, so, they, so the orientation of the stance is still the same. They don't fight in a forward and back like this, right? So they will still do, the, it's just that when they actually do the strike, they're not in a side stance. Well, obviously, if, if you have a horse stance here, you can't really reach. So instead, they will do the, the chopping motion like this. And then they will, you know, they will reach there, and then do another motion like this. But if you really pay attention, you can notice that they are still turning their body completely this way, or completely that way. They're not which is very different from styles that fight with both hands in the front. Right? They're not doing that, they're still turning either this way, or that way, or this way. So it's still very reminiscent of the older side stance orientated Chinese martial arts systems. But you can see that they are slot to have little variation and changes to suit the practitioner's need, right? their personal style or approach or understanding to combat. But overall, you can still classify Pigua as part of this size down style because its orientation is still the same. And, and it still limits, and the way they does their stuff still limits both hand access to the opponent at the same time with equal the, the distance. There's still a clear, close, and a far further reach hand in all the movements they do. And of course, you know, the classical finish move is still gonna be like here, here, there, and there. And this is a classical, you know, side stance Chinese martial arts kind of strike. Now, to show some contrast, let's look at styles that start to evolve out of the side stance and start to completely just throw, throw away side stance, right? So the first we're going to look at is Mantis. Mantis, its history is somewhat obscure, but it's believed that Mantis originally was based from Long Fist variant. And there are definitely um, evidence that that seems to suggest that it did. However, you know, we can't say for sure that Mantis definitely was an offspring from the Long First variant. However, if you look at the Mantis style in general, they came up with a stance that you know, had a different name for it, but uh, one of the better known names is called Mantis stance. So what, what is that? Right, so instead of having a, a bow stance or a horse stance, side stance, Mantis favors a stance where it's like a bow stance, but the back leg is bent and closer, right? So bow stance, the leg is long and dragging behind, whereas in Mantis stance, the leg is dragged in and shorter. So what this does is it allows this backhand to have closer reach, right? If you stay in a bow stance, if you want to reach with, with your backhand, you have to rotate your body quite a bit. Whereas if you have this leg closer, 
this hand reaches much easier. You can almost forward facing someone rather than sideways facing someone and have to rotate to reach the other side. And furthermore, this stance then allow you to shift forward and shift back a lot easier than if you have the regular bow stance, which is much more immobile. So mentors have two main stances that they fight from, right? One is this stance, sometimes it's not the same star stance or like fronty or empty stiff stance. And when they do stuff, it's going to a mantis stance. And this stance is also easier to switch between left and right compared to the traditional horse stance and bow stance. And if you look at a mantis form, right, in comparison to those northern long fist variants, you can clearly see the difference. For example, uh, in the Jai Yao form one, right, this example, they start over here, you see mantis stance, mantis stance, Enter stance, kick, empty step, empty step, mantis stance. So you can see that there's almost no side stance, no horse stance, and no bow stance. I'm not saying that there isn't, right? There are parts in the form that still has bow stance and still has horse stance. But it's much fewer compared to these older long first variants. Majority of the form are done through mantis stance, right? Let me take another mantis form, uh, gofa, right? The, the, the hooking hand. Again, you start off, mantis downs, mantis downs, and then from here, you do have a horse downs, a side downs essentially, and then you go back to other things. So, you know, some of you might say, ah, oh, you see, they are side downs. Mantis. Like I said, these are the exceptions and no longer the norm, right? What this would suggest to us is that originally there might be more side stones, but as they start evolving to mantis, they start to lose the side stones and only keep certain particular ones for certain particular reasons. And the reason for such is because other people are still fighting with side stones, which means if I can get hold of somebody's arm, and then still trap him, and then throw him off balance. So, if somebody else is presenting the opportunity for me, why not, right? Why not exploit it? And this is the reason why even some of these styles that have started to move away from side stance, they still have these side stance trapping techniques occasionally, because other people are still using this, so this is still a valid technique. But it's different to today's world, where at least in modern combat sport, nobody's using size on close range anymore, so the chance of you having the opportunity to apply a technique like this in today's world against combat sport and more up-to-date combat system is next to, is almost zero, which is why, like I said in the previous video, these are outdated techniques. I'm not saying that these are fake techniques or not real, but they're outdated. They no longer work efficiently like they once did when people are heavily relying on size downs to fight. So let's look at another mantis form. Fan Chu would probably have the most horse stance and side stance compared to all the other mantis form that I happen to know. But I haven't done this form in a long time because you know, I haven't been practicing forms ever since I started doing Tai Chi and Wuxing Tong Bei. But it just gives you like a rough idea, right? So it's in the form, it goes here, rear mantis stance, well, here is a side stance, which again is like basically. Somebody punch, you block, and you trap his leg, and then you hit him. But immediately after this, it goes into mantis stance with equal access to the opponent. And this is the revolutionary step. Compared to the long face variant, then you should be able to clearly see the difference, where the hands are going this way. And then from here, then it goes this way. Again, mantis stance. And from mantis stance, then they go into more mantis stance more mental stance, and then a side stance. So like I said, they still use a side stance once in a while, but you can clearly see there's not the main stance they're fighting from. The main stance they're fighting from is mental stance. That should be pretty obvious. So mantis is a good example of a style that basically most likely started with a lot more side stance, but as it evolved, it started to move away from relying on side stance and start to rely more on its own unique Mantis down, which is more mobile and give you better reach on both hands. Which is why Mantis is probably, in my opinion, a more evolved combat system to the older 
long first variant of Chinese martial arts. Next, let's look at Ba Gua. Right? Ba Gua is one of the youngest traditional Chinese martial arts. It was invented in the mid to late Qing Dynasty, and it's only be about fifth generations up to now, so it's relatively young. And someone, you know, in the last video, basically trying to argue that, you know, in one of the eight major hands of Ba Gua, there are horse down, therefore, you know, Ba Gua also uses side stones. But again, I've always been stressing this in all in the last video and in this video, that the majority of the time, Ba Gua is not using side stones. You can't use an exception to define the norm. Okay, anyone who's done the legitimate Ba Gua would know that Ba Gua has two main steps. One is called Bai, one is called Kou, Bai Kou Bu. That's essentially all there is to Bagua fundamental training. And when you combine this into a circle, that's basically the whole Bagua circle working, right? This is Bai, and this is Kou. Because you're doing Bai, Kou, Bai, Kou, and then you go to this way, Bai, Kou. And just from this alone, it should, it's really, it should already be quite obvious that this isn't a size on focus style because it doesn't train basic training in a size stance. Its form doesn't come out and doing these punches. Instead, it works in circles. How on earth can anyone think a style that focuses on working in circle actually predominantly uses a side stance combat approach? That's just ludicrous. And if you look at the most fundamental training of technique in Bagua, which is a single palm chain, right? Some of you might not know that Bagua didn't start off with 64 hand, didn't start off with eight palm chain. It started off with just two hand work, single palm and double palm. And if you look at single palm, you can clearly see, I mean, I don't do Bagua, so this is an imitation. You can clearly see that there is no side stones, right? Here, there, there, and back. And another basic Bagua training is called palm change like this. And from this you can already tell that they also prefer to have equal access with both hands. They don't want to fight on one side. They want to be able to do something with this hand and then follow up with something on this side. And to do that, they can't be fighting from a side stance. So why do they still have core stance occasionally in the form. Like I just said, because other people are still fighting for a side down. So it's a time where you want to exploit it. And of course, there are other scenarios where if you catch somebody in an off angle, then a step through the, between his legs might be able to throw him off balance. So in these scenarios, you might have an approach of a, a technique that might resemble a side stance. But the difference is, they don't actually fight from a side stance and move forward and back in a linear fashion, right? Bagua prefer to move in a more circular fashion. I'm not saying that Bagua fights by walking in circles, but you can see that it is excelling at cutting angles. If there's an attack, you're not gonna step back. Instead, you're gonna try to go sideways and then do something about it, and go sideways and do something about it. If that's not how Bagua fights, they shouldn't be focusing on training by Kobu. Another style that I already mentioned in the previous video, but let's just go through it again, is Xing Yi, right? And I've already said, in the classical spear, it's on the side stance, which is why, if you look at Ba Ji, another style that is in, in influenced and inspired by spear work, they still keep the original approach of side stance, right? If you look at the, the Ba Ji hand, this is almost like holding a spear. So that's the old way of translating weapon work into hand-to-hand -hand combat. But Xing Yi, being a more recent devel development, they basically, instead of having a side stance, well, they have san ti shi. And the significance about this is that, again, both hands have similar access to the opponent. And you're able to do combos with both hands without a significant rotation on your body or on your stance. You can keep the stance and be able to do punch with both hands and, and combinations. Again, right, I don't do Xing Yi, so this is just a crude imitation, but you should get the idea. And if you look at the most fundamental Xing Yi practice, the five elemental first, there are no side stones. Okay? I mean, you know, there is one side stance 
in the five elemental linking form, right? Where after you do that, you want to do this, and then that. Yeah, so this is almost like a side stance, but this is a, a transitional motion. If you take the five elemental first on its own, P, Zuan, Bong, Pao, Heng. There are no side stance at, at all. So this should be a fairly simple observation that anyone can make. And of course, you know, there probably are side stance in the, in the top animal, etc. But again, like I said, those are the exceptions. They are not the norm. Based on this core technique, you can see Xin Yi favors in fighting in a way that both hands have equal access. Next, let's look at Tai Chi, which is the one that is slightly more confusing. Because like I said, the four, the four father of Tai Chi, which is Chen style, basically has its root from Qi Guang's 32 posture first classic, which is why in Chen style you see a lot of side stars. Whether it is, you know, things like Lan Zha Yi, and these things, or Dan Bian, right, which also a side stance. And even with Xie Xing Ao Bu, right, the diagonal line, they are going diagonal. Um, so like, like this, you know, every star does it differently, but you know, this is roughly how it goes. It goes diagonally, but you can still see that you know, things like this, it's still pretty much a side stance. Or even, you know, Dao Nian Hong. So you can still see a, a hit emphasis on side stance in the original Chen style Tai Chi. And also, like I showed in the last video already, if you look at the Chen style's push hand, they're also pretty much pushing from a more side stance oriented motion compared to the modern Yang style push hand, which is you know, more forward facing rather than sideways facing. Now, how does that translate into the Yang style form? Right? Some people think the Yang style form are pretty much still using side stance, but that's not true. So if you look at the Yang style form, right from here, the start, this looks like a bow stance, but you can see that there's actually space between the two legs. So when you complete this motion, these legs are actually apart from one another. And in the beginning of the video, I already said, a side stance into a bow stance, both are on the same line. So when you rotate into a bow stance, they're still more or less on the same line. But in Tai Chi, you can clearly see that you're actually stepping to an angle to the side to better balance your body. So you don't want them to be on the same line because the balancing is not as good. You want to have a balance that can switch in six directions, which is why the stance actually it will look like a bow stance, but you're actually stepping diagonally. And from here, again, right, you step diagonally. So these things that may look like a side stance are no longer a side stance. And even when you look at its diagonal step, which you know, Yang Sao Taiji took out the Chen style's diagonal step, right, which is here. And then from, from there, right, this is a rough idea of how, how it goes. This is a diagonal step, right? Chen, uh, Yang Sao took that out and made it into low qi ao bu, brushing knee step, which, was, which is, again, a triangular step, right, which looks like this. So, if you do from th th this way, right, instead of going from here, there, there, and then there, which is like a side stance, it looks like here. You see, it's a, I'm facing the front, but I'm, I'm in a stance that is not on a singular line. And then there, there, and there. So it's just a rough indication. So this type of stepping in Chinese we call it Ren Zi Bu, right? So I think in English people call it the triangular step because you want to step like this. So this is basically another significant improvement from the traditional way where people fight in a linear way. When stars start to take triangular steps, then they are starting to understand the importance of cutting angles. And Tai Chi, Yang Sao Tai Chi onwards is more certainly one of them that starts understanding the significance of cutting angles. And also see that from the basic Tai Chi step. Not all lineage practices, but Tai Chi step, 
look something like this. You see, it is diagonal stepping. And why would Tai Chi practice the step if they actually want to fight from the side stop? Right? That doesn't make sense. So from this basic trend, you can see that Yang style Tai Chi has already moved away from a side stop orientated fighting method. Instead, it favors something that is forward facing, both hands having equal access. And this Tai Chi step, the later on influence each one. Right? which became more tabu, right, the frictional step, which function in a very similar way. And the advantage of this is that at any moment, both hands can strike at the same time, rather than be limited to a main hand and a back hand. And lastly, let's quickly look at uh, Wu Xing Kong Bei, right? Um, again, I've already mentioned earlier in the video, our basic training is all done through the empty step. There's, there's no horse dance at all. When you join the start, you don't have to require to practice horse dance. You don't practice both stance. You go straight into this stance. And you don't learn any other stunts so from here onwards, it's just the stunts. Occasionally, we want to do a, a, a mid punch, for example, the stunts extend, but it's, it's not a side stunt because this foot has to point forward. And this foot cannot be on the same line, they have to be slightly off. In fact, even, even this stunts, we don't want the heel to be on the same line, right? which is typically what a side stunt person would do, they want to align the heels. But when you do that, you're kind of imbalanced. So instead, we make a stance where the toes are on the same line and the heels are off like this. So you can see that the far better balance when you're standing like this than you're standing like this or like that. So these are all small differences that you can see how styles moved away from the side stance orientation. And while in the, in the Tongbei form, there are times where you do a large motion that can go into a whole stance, right? For example, I want to do a, a big Try jump. It can be like this. But again, these are just the exception and not the norm, right? This is what happens when someone else is in a side down and I'm trying to trap it. But majority of the time, in the Tongbei form as well as the basic practice, they're orientated on this where they're launching their moves. And occasionally step forward to do a mid punch and then maybe try to cut corners and then do something else but they don't have a lot of side down orientated punches like the old long first variant. This is not to say that Tongbei doesn't have the old trapping technique, it still does. Well, one of his techniques is called uh, Pisha, which looks like this. And you'll notice again, if you trap somebody, and, you sh and as you do this, you throw him off balance. So they're still reminiscent from the old days. But the emphasis they put on these techniques is far less and far more on striking things that's a combination of both hands. For example, you know, try, pi, sorry. For example, like, you know, try, pi, zuan. This is the more common combo practiced in Tongbei. Or like, you know, chuan, pi, pi. But out of the 108 Tongbei hand, I don't know them all, right? but from the ones I do know, there's maybe two or three techniques where they go into a whole stance. And very few people, if any, actually still try to practice them and use them. The majority of his, of his focus has been shifted to practicing in this stance, moving forward and back, and, and techniques that can directly launch from here. And like I mentioned in the previous video, the same thing can be observed in the, in the southern martial arts side, where it starts like Hongge still has a heavy resemblance of side stance, although they also have Arzi Qian Yang Ma, right? In Hongge you have this stance too, but there are still occasions where they will go into a big stance. Right? I mean, not these, these are just for training purpose, but there are still times where you know, they will have like a, a bow stance like this, or they have a uh, la la dian tree, which is still a side stance punch, so you can still see resemblance of it. Another good example is, uh, you know, tre lei you know, they have things, I don't do tre lei but I have friends who does this, I'm just gonna make a crude imitation, where they'll be like, you know, here, there, and there, something like that, and there you can still see the resemblance of, of the stance changing that is belonging to the old side stance, like long first variant. But if you look at Wing Chun and the Hakka variant, you know, everyone is fighting with two hands equal distance and in a stance like this, right? with Wing Chun or, you know, Mantis, they will be fighting like this 
So you can see that even there, you know, it starts to move away. And of course, if you look at it in modern day trolley floods, while they're still retaining some of the, the you know, cool strikes, you know, they have very good strikes like these, like that. You know, this is also typical size down strike. You're not going to do this if you are fighting like, like this. So they still have these strikes, but also you know, as a whole, they've been moving away from fighting in a size down rather than you know, they're going into boxing stance. Which, like I said early on, it's not a bad thing, but you have to acknowledge the fact that this isn't always the way. So this is an involvement and improvement from back in the days. And there's still a lot of people in Chinese martial arts who are still hanging on to the old way of fighting the side down. And my video was intended to show these people that they're outdated and it's time for them to move up. So if your style has already moved on, then you should have no problem with my video. However, some people um, actually get offended for some reason that I don't understand. And that's pretty sad and pathetic. So, I hope this actually has more than enough evidence to show you that Chinese martial arts used to heavily rely on fighting from a side stance, but then later on they start, they start to change away from that, and in today's modern combat sports, you almost don't see side stance at all, only occasionally in specific scenarios. Majority of the time, you will have a better balanced stance that is easier to move forward and back and be able to cut angles, and, you know, and do all these that with equal access on both sides. And like I said in the last video, combat needs to evolve and improve. The old way is not always the best way. And lastly, let's just talk about the mechanics of why size down is bad. So besides mobility issue, the issue of, of accessing with both arms, another issue is the fact that it, it has a great full and back support, but not a lot of left and right support, right? Why is that important? Because when you're in a side stance, you can have no problem launching any linear attack, right? If I do a punch like this, it's fine. If I do a punch like this, two things also fine. If people hit you on the side, you might lose balance. But if not, this is fine, and you can continue to, to do these things, or switch around and do these things. However, hooks becomes a problem. I mean, I do know that some of these uh, long first variants have variations of the hook, but overall, hook is a problem to be launching from the stance because, right, Newton's third law, when there's an action, there's a reaction, when there's a force, there's a force against that force. So when you are throwing a hook onto something, a same force is coming back to you, which is going to knock you that way, and because of the way you stand, you can't really use your whole body in a, in a good support. If you use a lot of force, you might knock your body sideways. So the way to mitigate that is to not use your body and only swing your arm, right? In some of the long first variant styles, you see that, you know, those who do a punch like this, which is disconnected from their body, so just swing their arm. But if you try to do a hook like this, you either lose balance this way, or you hit something and then lose balance that way. Which is why if you look at modern combat sports, such as boxing, right, when they are standing, the reason they want to stand like this, not in the same line, is because when they throw a hook, you see that the legs are almost like a triangle, so that they have the best support and brace for impact. The force that, go, that comes bounces back to the opponent is absorbed in a better structure, so you wouldn't knock yourself backwards. Same with if I threw a hook this way, same thing, right? The feet are like a triangle, it's balanced like this, so that I have maximum ability to absorb the impact and, and the reactive force. And which is also why in the other system that I've just mentioned, like Tai Chi, they also want to have a, a space between the legs so that you have better support left and right, not just forward and back. Which is why, in the long first variant from back in the days, there isn't a lot of hooks, at least not power hooks, because of the stance they're in, it's very hard to do a power hook. And in the bow stance, this way it also kind of threatens your balance. And uppercut also, right? Sometimes you do occasionally see them doing uppercut like this, but it's, it's linear. It's, it's hard to do an angled uppercut without having a slightly sideways stance to compensate for the momentum. Right, so unfortunately this video is a bit long. The moment you, know, you go into more details, the video tends to get longer, but I hope that you know, those of you that did watch through this whole video, might, you might, you know, I hope you learn something more, or something that you don't know previously about what is Chinese moral history, or how these styles work, or the disadvantage of still using side sounds as a main combat method. If you enjoyed the video and find it helpful, please subscribe me on my YouTube channel. 
And be sure to click the bell icon to get noticed whenever I upload a new video and stay up to date with all my content. And if you want to support me on Patreon, that would be greatly appreciated. A shout out to all my Patreon supporters. Thank you so much for your support. Your support enables me to continuously making videos and sharing my knowledge and experience in Chinese traditional martial arts. And lastly, I'd like to wish everyone to be safe and healthy and you know, still try to stay away from the crowd and try to get vaccinated as soon as possible so that you know, eventually we'll reach herd immunity and put this entire pandemic nightmare behind us. So thanks for watching Trans Martial Channel. Keep all, keep safe, and I'll see you next time.